Welcome to the Into the Wilderness podcast. This week, it's going to be mainly water-based. I will be here in the background, but as a few of the topics I don't really know much about, I'm actually going to just sit and educate myself and try and, try and add in when I can. We're going to be joined in the studio by two guests. One is a fishery scientist and the other is the chairman of the Esk Rivers and Fisheries Trust. Topics for discussion will include freshwater mussels, the Atlantic salmon... We're also going to touch on catch and release, biodiversity, beavers are going to get a mention, um, trawlers, signal crayfish, you name it, we're going to talk about it. And in particular, at the end, we're going to discuss the, the wild fisheries review, which is a really important part of our, our river system's future in Scotland in particular. This podcast is brought to you by the Scottish Association for Country Sports. And if you want to keep up to date with what they've been up to, at any point in time, the best place for that is to check out their Facebook page where you'll get daily updates on the latest news and what the team has been up to. Welcome to another episode of the Into Wilderness podcast. This week we've got a, a very different topic to discuss on what we've been discussing the last, uh, last couple of months. It's very much going to be fishing focused. In the studio, we've got two guests. We've got Tom Sampson and Marshall Halliday. Uh, both sit on the Esk Rivers and Fisheries Trust. Tom, just tell me a little bit about yourself. You are the chairman of the Esk Rivers and Fisheries Trust. I know you're, you're a farmer. You've got a fascination with fishing, but what's your, what's your story? How did you actually end up on the trust? And have you, you're involved in a couple of other organizations as well. Just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I just my background is in, is in farming. I've I've pretty much farmed all my life. I'm an arable farmer in Angus. Um, it's fishing is something I I didn't I didn't start fishing very young. I used to, I came to fishing in my twenties when I came back to live in Angus, and just it gradually grew on me. Some would say consumed me, um, and um, and so I've always been involved in. I've been an active angler. That that that's that's my involvement with with fishing in this area. I have no proprietorial interest in any any fishing in in the area. Um, I sort of fell into the trust, I think, slightly by accident through people I knew, probably, who, and when it was first set up, and they were looking for people to get involved. And um, I I someone asked me to be chairman. I think no, I can't quite remember <laughs> can't quite remember the um, the exact process of it. So I ended up probably more by accident and design as chairman and I, I enjoy doing it and I've been doing it pretty much since the trust was yeah. was formed there was a there was a brief was there a brief chairman before me I can't remember I don't think so no um, I, I, you, were, you were the first yeah so it's probably time for a new one <laughs> <laughs> and the, the the fishing that I mean you you have a fascination with fishing I know actually have previous conversations with you, you you really do have a thing about eels actually what what, what is ha- how did, where did that come from I have a I, I on a on the smallest of the of the rivers in our area, the, the Lunan, I, I have an old I have an old watermill which is um, has an old eel trap in it, and um, we've always caught eels in it, and um, so that's that's always been my interest in eels. So there was it used to be quite a you know there was a commercial side to it. We caught them enough, but now the catches are down, and we just in fact this year we haven't fished it at all. It's the first year we haven't fished it at all for a long time, but I, they're they're an interesting. Creatures eels, um, very interesting fish. And, uh, um, and what what is the, most of the fishing that you do these days? Is it migratory into trout? I've always I, I've I've always been a salmon fishing and salmon and sea trout fishing. My I think my still my greatest love is is, is fishing at night for sea trout. Um, but I'm more and more drawn drawn to trout fishing. I I wouldn't say I'm giving up fishing for salmon and uh, and. Um, I certainly when the opportunity arises, but I don't seek it out as much as I used to. But I do now start to. I, I really enjoy trout fishing now. Um, and Marshall, your your background, you come from a, a very different different background. And I, I, as I was saying to you actually before we started recording, I don't really know exactly how you you got to to where you are today. But to just give us a, a little bit of background, how you started. Well, it really started from a childhood interest and almost passion in fishing, um, and I came from air and I used to fish regularly um, for finnip, uh, for brown trout, for grayling on the river air and particularly using a dry fly. 
and really enjoyed that. Um, eventually I graduated to some salmon fishing when I could afford it um, and really tried to combine a career, uh, make a career out of fisheries. So I did zoology at university and then did postgraduate work actually on fish diseases and that led me into fish farming and I spent 18 months in Denmark um, working at the university there um, associated with problems in trout farming. And from there, I joined a, a long-established company in Montrose to set up salmon farming from them. And really was very, very heavily involved in setting up salmon farms and also heavily involved in the salmon farming industry um, in both terms of production and also salmon marketing latterly. Um, and the company I worked for was also um, one of the largest salmon netting companies in Scotland. So I developed a fairly all-round knowledge of um, salmon in all its shapes and forms and all its methods of exploitation in Scotland. Um, laterally, um, I decided to try and move into more conservation-oriented activities and became clerk to the ESC District Salmon Fishery Board, which I found extremely interesting and quite challenging, particularly it was at a period where stocks were declining and there was a lot of concern about the future of salmon, and there, indeed there still is. And then the trust formed um, in 2009, and that was a tremendous opportunity to actually try and do some practical conservation work to improve the habitat for our fisheries in the widest sense, um, and also other species as well. Uh, Tom, what is the... For, every, for those people who don't know, what, what is the remit of the trust? What, what is the purpose of, of the Estrivers and Fisheries Trust? I think you can probably look at the, the, the fisheries trusts in general, that, that they're probably all slightly different how they operate. But we're a charity. We are, we're a charity, and we, we, we're not involved in this. Because in the, the whole field of migratory fish, there's a statutory side involved. We're not involved in the statutory side. That's, um, that's left to the board. So we, we do what you might say, we almost do like the fluffy stuff, the, the stuff that, with all the environmental stuff. But more and more, we're, we're, I, I think we're taking a bigger and bigger role. And, and I wouldn't say the board is decreasing its role, but I think our role is more important now than the board's. I mean, we, we're, we are, our, our charitable remit to us is to conserve and enhance the, st the stocks of fish in our rivers. And that, that is what we're trying to do by any means we can. Um, and I, th I think that's, that, that's, as, that's what we've always kept as our, our aim, and, and um, that's what we will continue to keep as our aim. Uh, Marshall, one of the, the most interesting projects uh, that, that the Trust has uh, been part of in the last couple of years was the, the rerouting of Rottle Burn. Just talk through why that was done and what the, the benefits are now, now that we have a chance to, to look back on, on how it's turned out. Well, the Rottle Burn um, is quite an important tributary in the upper South Esk located in Glen Clover. And probably somewhere between about 1800 and 1830, it was completely canalised, completely straightened um, as a flood preventative measure, as a local road was subject to flooding. In about 2003 to 2004, just prior to the Water Framework Directive coming into force, um, it was dredged completely uh, the bottom 700 metres had a JCB in it and removed all the substrate, piled it up in the banks. And of course, this was a huge eyesore in a really beautiful part of Scotland. Not only that, but it, des it destroyed the habitat completely for salmon and trout. And there was a lot of concern about the state of the Rotal Burn. And personally, I, it was just something that, that hit me as it would be a tremendous project to try and restore it. And by chance, about 2010, we were giving a talk in a village hall uh, about the South Esk in general. And we had a map of the South Esk, and we asked people to put little post-it notes on areas of concern. And one landed in the Rotal Burn. And I eventually located the person who had put that there. It was a, a lady who, who lived up in Glen Clover. And we started talking, and I said, you know, I'd love to do something. And unfortunately, I said, I just don't know where to start, how we get a handle on it. And she said she had some old aerial photographs, which gave some information on the previous route. So I immediately got that, 
and started thinking about it, discussing it with others, and then was advised to put an application into um, what is now the Water Environment Fund, which is administered by the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency, SEPA. And we were successful there, and we drew up an options report to try and evaluate um, really four ways of restoring the rotor burn. We researched old maps, we uh, researched the area on the ground, and we identified quite a, a substantial part of what we think was the original channel. So the restoration plan was really built around that. And we consulted widely. Uh, we were very, very fortunate indeed having the tremendous cooperation from D. Ward, yeah, who was the owner him. of Rotary Estates. And he was on the, on the trust at the time. Yes, yeah. he was a trustee, and he really... Um, allowed us to use quite a substantial area of ground to re-meander the river. Um, we eventually got the plan agreed and got all the relevant permissions from SEPA and from Angus Planning Department and did that in 2012. The channel was completed in August 2012 and we had fish spawning in the new channel in November 2012, which was tremendous to see and we got the whole thing on video. Um, since then, the channel has evolved considerably because it's a very, very high energy system in that there's two main tributaries of the Rotal Burn that flow off the hill um, and where they come down um, just above the bridge, it's very, very fast flowing and, and the channel is very, very active at that point and has moved in one or two places almost 15 metres from the original um, plan. Um, as you move downstream, the channel becomes less active and it has not changed anything like to that extent. So we've converted what was 700 metres of dead straight channel into 1.2 kilometres of meandered channel. Um, we've had studies carried out by a number of universities on the area. We've monitored the whole development of the channel on a three monthly basis so we can map out the changes. We've got a flow meter in which records um, water flows. We've carried out extensive invertebrate sampling which shows the very rapid recolonization of a new channel by invertebrates. And of course we've done electric fishing to establish the densities of juvenile fish. One of the problems with the old channel was the fact that it had developed into quite a reasonable spawning channel with, with good um, supplies of gravel and spawning substrate, but there was no habitat for um, fish to develop and to establish territories. So the first major spate basically washed all the juvenile fish out the burn, and you never got anything beyond really not plus, and just an occasional one plus par, so one year old par. Whereas in the rotal burn that we've got now, we are getting um, fully functional par populations. Um, so we can see the benefit. Um, in salmon production in Rotalburn and obviously trout. One of the great challenges would be to try and reintroduce freshwater pearl mussels. And we were talking about that with um, Scottish Natural Heritage last week. And I think we will be trying to do that in the next year or so by taking some freshwater pearl mussels from um, one or two areas where there is a high density of mussels and transporting them into the Rotalburn. Uh, no, I, I actually I didn't know that. I mean, that uh, it was a question that I was going to ask a little bit later. But since you brought it up, we'll talk about it now. The freshwater pearl mussels—they're not found everywhere. Just can you? You're pro probably the best person to to explain this. What is their link to salmon, and why is it so important to make sure that we protect the populations of freshwater pearl mussels that we have? Well, freshwater pearl mussels are a tremendous indicator of water quality. They, they only thrive where you've got really good water quality. And, of course, that is um, a mirror of what salmon require, too. Um, they are an integral part of, of the life cycle of salmon in that the early stages of freshwater pearl mussels actually um, use the young salmon, the par, as a host uh, for their development. And they insist on the gills of salmon um, throughout the winter, they're then released from there and establish themselves on the river substrate. And the river substrate's got to be varied. It's got to be reasonably, uh, a reasonable combination of sort of cobble with some um, pockets of um, sand where the freshwater pearl mussel can bury into and establish themselves. Um, it's got to have a reasonable flow regime so that obviously it's stable and the substrate doesn't get washed out. And perhaps we can talk about the problem of high flows 
mm. um, in, in another point. But the freshwater mussel, pearl mussel, is an iconic species from Scotland. It um, has the um, accolade of being the only invertebrate that actually has caused uh, an invasion of a country in that it's um, stated that Julius Caesar was very, very fond of freshwater pearl mussels both to eat and also the pearls that they generate. And that was one of the facts that motivated him moving north into Scotland. Well, there you so go. So it's a right? tremendous history. <laughs> His historical information as well as what's going on currently. Um, Tom, I, I seem to remember not that long ago there was a bit of a problem with poaching of freshwater pearl mussels. I, I'm, I'm not sure if your memory is any better than mine, but it certainly has occurred in our locality in, in the recent years. I think, I think there have been instances of, of, of people a, a free-for-all on, on freshwater pearl mussels. I, th I believe that if, if, if you go back and, and, and look at the, the original mm. skilled freshwater pearl mussels, they could... Uh, Marshall, can be right on this, yeah. but they could open the pearl. They could open per freshwater pearl mussels without killing them. Is that or I'm is that not? not sure. I think yeah. that's maybe is, a is tale. A or, yeah, I think so. And think um, there, there have been. I mean, I I don't mm. think now there is much of a problem with that. I'm aware, but there is there is anecdotal evidence in yes. the past that, that that people just randomly coming in and, and opening up whole beds yeah. of freshwater yeah. pearl mussels and and basically killing them. Yeah, yeah that's. That there has been the odd incident reported on the South Esk over the last couple of years, but it it's, tends to be fairly isolated. Well, I mean, that, that's good. And I suppose that the point that anyone should be aware of is that they are protected, and if they do mm. see open mussels in the river and it Indeed. looks like it's you know, been because of poaching... It's been report, pillaged. Who, who would you report that to, Marshall? Um, you'd be best to report it to the Wildlife Crime Unit in the police in the first instance. But, I mean, obviously report it to the Fishery Board, and then we can pass it on. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom, that, that is just one project of many that the, the Trust has been uh, part of and instigated in the last couple of years. What, what other big projects that people might not be aware of have, have been undertaken? Most of our big... We're, we're, we've been involved in, in some small... We have not some small barrier removal projects in, mainly in smaller burns, not in, not in the main, main river. Um, we've got obviously got an interest in what happens in the Morphy Dyke, but that's on the North Esk. Um, but that's uh, probably at the moment too big, a, too big a project for us to be involved in, and there are other issues involved with it. Um, we've got a lot of on, ongoing projects. They tend to be on the smaller. We've done a lot more work in the South on the South Esk. Really, I think we perceive of, of the rivers in our area. We perceive that the South Esk. There are more problems involved with the South Esk. I mean, the, the North Esk is. We would love to do more projects in the in the North Esk, but there are probably less problems. I think it's fair to say. Um, and, the, and the South Esk is is a more fertile ground for us finding projects. We've got two potentials, quite big projects, both in getting in conjunction with SEPA on the on the the low, two of the lower tributaries of the South Esk, the Power and the Melgan. Um, and it's much more difficult for us in the long term to to manage and get get projects off the ground in lowland arable in lowland arable farmland because you're dealing with the nature of any project. We're probably talking about taking some land out out of production, and you're obviously dealing with a much higher value land value in those areas. So people are, and, and naturally the farmers, landowners, whoever are naturally going to be much more reluctant to give up land to an environmental project. Um, although they're, they're, they are, I would say, in, in, they're sympathetic to our aims. And it's the, there's, a, there's a thing of trying to find a balance between you know, how much will they give us, can we... You know, um, whereas if you go into the upland, a project like Rottle, which is, to be honest, is upland clover, it's much less... The land value up there is much less. So there's, there's much more potential and people are less worried about giving up more land. And they, and they may actually perceive that the environmental benefit of giving up their land, that land outweighs any economic benefit they were previously getting getting from it. So it's mainly that we've we've always, as a trust, we you know, a lot of trust do a lot of science, and that's for them to do. We are definitely we are a pro, our aim is to deliver projects on the ground. Any project that we can deliver to help the fish in our rivers, that that is our aim. I mean, the the um, Trust has built a, a couple of fish passes in the last few years. Uh, 
Do, do you have any numbers of how many miles of river we've opened up? I, I should have really looked this up before the podcast, but it must be quite substantial now. Certainly on, on the POW system, um, above where we put in the fish pass, I think there's about 30 kilometres of river above that because the, the POW divides into eight tributaries, um, not all of which will be able to sustain salmon population, but certainly... Um, there is opportunity for salmon spawning above the fish pass, and of course you've got you've got good populations of trout. So, I mean, in terms of the simple things that uh, people could do if they're walking, you know, walking around, the, the, there's lots of small rivers that run into mm -hmm. bigger rivers that are that are tributaries of major systems that, like the South Esk. If they see blockages, is that something that's worth reporting? It's worth reporting, certainly, yeah, because um, we, we do every year with these big spates that we get, get trees washed down that can create quite serious blockages. And um, the quicker these are dealt with, the better. Um, Tom, you, you mentioned Morphe Dyke. Um, we won't talk about it for too long, but what, what has been the problem with Morphe Dyke in the past? Where are we today and, and what's the future going forward with regard to Morphe Dyke? I, I can't give you the exact historical, but Morphe Dyke is, is a major obstruction on on the, or in, in its full form, but it is obviously now breached. Um, so it's a major obstruction to salmon on the on the North Esk. Um, there are lots of historical reasons why it's there, and there was there were good valid reasons why it was there for other economic benefits other than fishing. In the I'm sure in the in the going back into history, it now serves absolutely no purpose. Um, to any industry or other other um, economic activity, um, so basically it held it held salmon back in the spring. The spring it was the main problem was the spring run was held back behind the Morphe Dyke. There's an element of there is a there is a perfectly good fish passing, but there's always an element of temperature barrier. Some fish went over. So as far as we're concerned, as the trust, we would we just want to see the freest pa possible passage of fish up the river. Um, and the Morphe Dyke plays no part in that. There, there can be debates about whether we just uh, allow the l allow nature to take its course with the dike, and it, I think it will eventually be removed. Whether that or whether we need to more actively manage the breach, but we can't. I can see no circumstances. There are you hear talk of people saying why the dike should be reinstated and stuff like that, but I can see no no circumstances in which we could ever support the reinstatement of the dike. Apart from the kind of aspects that we've talked about already, what are the, the major predation issues for salmon? I mean, it, you know, it is part of a... They are as, as much a part of the life cycle of, as it, all the other species that rely on the river and re, indeed rely on the salmon as they are important. But is there any major predation issues that something could be done about? I mean, it, I know it, it's quite a difficult one because some, some of the species that predate on them are, are protected in their own right. I think most of the species that predate on the most protect is protected in their own right, which is a, a there there there, are, there is a, a predation is an issue, and um, I, I think you've got to look at this from both sides because the 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 anglers um, would obviously and the fishery owners would obviously like to see the least possible predation on that. So you've got you've got sawbill ducks in the river, cormorants, magansas, gusanders. You've got a yeah, you've then probably got seals in the mouths of the river, and and even now people are talking about what are the dol what's the dolphin population in the North Sea doing to the population of salmon as as they go in and out. I, and I, I can't give you exact answers on all that, but I think you do have to look at it from another point of view, and that the 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 wildlife lobby, whatever, is is strong. They're not going to go away. I mean, I think it's unrealistic to expect that we can um, we can just say, well, we don't like predation. We will. Um, you know, take means to to um, get rid of the predators. That, that, that in in the real world, that is not going to happen. I'm not absolutely convinced of that. I think we have to think slightly out of the box on predation and about other ways we can we can minimise its effect. Um, in an ideal world, you have a balanced system, and there are there are you know the predators take their share. There's enough for everyone to take their share. The argument I think is whether at the moment whether the the, the, the with a decline, I think we have to do talk about a decline, particularly in Atlantic salmon, 
whether the predators are taking more than their share. And it's a very thorny issue about how you reduce that level of, of predation. I, I, without, because it does involve, you know, predating the predators. Yeah. You know, and, and that will that raises issues, a whole lot of other issues. And the wildlife lab lobby is, is strong, and, and, and they've, they've got their point of view, which is very valid. Uh, and of course, um, off the coast of Aberdeen, we have one of the largest pods of dolphins in Europe. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Marshall, from a scientific viewpoint, leaving everything else aside, just looking at, at the numbers, I mean, what, is, what, what story does that tell? Should we be doing more to control... Um, the species that are predating on salmon or, you know, as humans, we always have interfered, if you want to call, uh, call it that, or certainly it's very much the case that a lot of the, a lot of what we do is part of a management plan. You know, we, we spend a lot of time on these podcasts talking about management plans with regard to, to deer. That, that comes up quite a lot. a lot. We've had a lot of stalkers on the podcast. Managing a species which is only in our river system for a relatively short period of time compared to its life cycle is very difficult, and we can only really affect a, quite a small part of that. Is it the case that we should be doing more to against predation on, on salmon, or is the problem actually somewhere else? Well, I think predation is, is a natural phenomenon in all biological systems, and biological systems have evolved to deal with that, such that there is survival of the predator and prey species. And it's perhaps the influence of man that has perhaps or could perhaps disrupt that balance by applying conservation means, which are probably justified for one species, which favours that species, allows that species to expand perhaps out of proportion to its original population. And then you get these interactions which affect other interests. And you're absolutely right saying that the the situation is largely artificial because of conservation means and therefore there should be sensible management regimes. But you then come up against, as Thomas said, the very, very uh, powerful wildlife interests and, you know, thank goodness we've got powerful wildlife interests to conserve our wildlife in Scotland um, but, and you have to try and get a way forward that suits everyone. And certainly um, with regard to seals it's very difficult I don't personally believe that seals are, as a, as a population, are major predators of salmon. I think you do get the odd rogue seal, um, which will take salmon. And indeed, you see that if you go down on a summer's evening in Montrose Bay, you will see an odd seal um, taking, taking a fish. And similarly, in the winter time in the South Esk, you will see seals entering the river where kelts are descending, where they're easy prey. But I think you've got to remember that salmon are very, very powerful, fast-swimming fish, particularly in the summertime, and seals are not going to waste a whole lot of energy trying to chase these fish when there are much easier prey to catch, like flounders and eels, mm. for, um, and the energy expenditure is much less. Uh, actually, uh, seals were, was on my list for, for later on, and I think you've, you've probably answered the, the question, but it, it's not the case that the seals as a population are all trying to Abs catch Absolutely salmon. not. No, it, I mean, it, it tends to be a handful of individuals that it, have It's an odd road seal that perhaps learns how to ambush salmon in, in, when the tide's in them and throws bay, it will sit in the bottom in a hollow created by sandbanks and then when a salmon goes overhead, it can perhaps try and uh, catch it. But I mean, a sea mammal research unit have tracked seals and the majority of seals um, will go well out to sea to feed and they feed on the bottom. In terms of the, the measures that are currently in place and available for tackling these rogue seals, what, what is possible? It, it, they can be shot under licence. And that requires an application and An application and, proof. and full justification of the rationale and the issues involved. And, and what about non-lethal methods? Do they, do they work and they are they can, you, you can use seal scares, which are or can be effective um, particularly the ones that have operate with variable frequency because um, seals can um, acclimatize or adapt to frequencies. They can also um, basically stick their head under the water or stick, sorry, stick their head up, out of the water and obviously escape the, the pulse and um, swim upstream past the acoustic scarer. So they're quite smart So they're, they're pretty smart. Um, 
Tom, we, I mean, a lot of what we've been talking about has been off the back of the fact, and the numbers support this across you know, all of Scotland, I think, I'd be right in saying, is that the, the population of, of salmon, and we've only, we've only really been talking about salmon to this point, are in decline. And they're in decline to, uh, to an extent now where a lot of people are starting to talk about it. And we're, we're going to get to the Wild Fisheries Review as we get towards the end of this podcast. From your own point of view and the knowledge that you have, why are salmon in decline? I know this is a, a very open-ended question and no one really has the answer, but what's your, your personal opinion? Why are we really struggling now to hold on to our Atlantic salmon? My gut feeling is, is still that the, the, the problem is at sea. The main problems are at sea. I, the, some people say global warming, shifting of feeding grounds. I, do, I don't. I'm not a fishery scientist and I don't have the, answer, the answers to that. From what I can see in the river, it seems that the, our juvenile, I among mean, where we've done work, electrofishing, our juvenile you know, populations of, of, of salmon pars uh, are good. You know, you know, our, our spawning burns are reasonably well stocked. So um, we, are, we are sending enough fish to sea, but they're not coming back. They're not coming. Yeah. Marshall can probably tell you the exact figure, but what the. the the re return ratio of smolts was it used to it used to be yeah it, uh, i mean in in the heyday of salmon in the last 30 40 years in the late 60s 70s um survival at sea was the order of 50 percent and survival at sea now has declined to well under 10 percent. so it's a massive change i mean i am not expecting you actually to be able to answer this question but how do you tackle that? And does that not m mean that what we are doing inland is really, you know, a futile attempt to tackle what is what is the major problem? Well, I, th I think people would, would, would generally subscribe to the fact that the major problem is marine. But notwithstanding that, we have got to do as much as we possibly can to preserve the freshwater environment so to maximise its productivity so that the, the maximum smolts are going to see and hopefully we can in increase the numbers coming back by improving that. I think climate change is a major factor, both in um, freshwater and at sea. There's a temperature effects at sea. There's um, global warming. Um, there's even um, some people saying that you know salmon could decline in Scotland to the extent where they, they disappear if global warming really takes off. Um, I think the other aspect of global warming is... Uh, River, the way it affects river flows. And certainly one of the main things that I've got a personal concern about is the immense floods that we're getting over this last 10, 20 years. And if you measure water flows um, over the last 30 years, there has been a massive increase in both the extent of river flows and the frequency of high river flows. And these can do immense damage to the banks. They can wash out spawning beds. They can clear tributaries of, of um, juvenile fish on occasions, and it can obviously affect fresh, freshwater pearl mussels. So there's a lot of work that we're trying to do to see if we can offset the effects of climate change um, in the upper catchment through tree planting, uh, um, both near the river and along the contours of the hills, to try and reduce the rate of runoff of these heavy rainfall events into the rivers. So is it definitely the case that what what you've described is as a result of heavier rainfall or is it land management practices? It's a combination. Um, in the 70s, um, there was a lot of pressure to improve land productivity. So there was a lot of drainage works carried out. You had rivers canalised. I mean, we talked about the Rotal Burn earlier. All these contribute to increasing the speed with which water comes off the hill into the tributaries and into the main river. And 30, 40 years ago, the pattern of river flow was that there would be a, a gen, in a heavy rainfall event, there would be a gentle rise um, over a, a day or two, um, and then the river would hold that level for a few days and then gentle decline. Um, in the last few years, you just see a massive spike. It will rise six, eight feet within a period of six, eight hours, um, hit a maximum flow, and then drop down. And this is in no one's interest um, if you can prolong that runoff, you get much better angling conditions, um, it's better for the river, it's better for all stakeholders, less flooding, etc. So there's a, a, 
it, it's one of these projects that we're involved in that has uh, immense benefits in terms of flooding and the environment uh, and wildlife as a whole. Tom, as a as a farmer, that's very much part of you know day to day activities for you in terms of drainage and land use. But you have the other side where you you've got this interest as chairman of the trust and an interest in river systems. How how do you sort that balance? And and what can farmers do who are maybe not that in tune with you know with the biodiversity and and, and flow of, of rain and, and precipitation into river systems. What what can they do as part of their farming practices to help this? I think from if you come at this purely from the farming community side of things, there's still a perception that if you have water on your land, you just want to get it off your land as fast as possible, um, which then leads to other problems in rivers and you you know, speeding up flows. And it, it's it doesn't require giving up a lot of land to slow you know, a to get the the water off where you don't want it, but also to slow it down. Uh, you know, and it, I think it's the speed of which we're trying to remove water from land. I mean, you know, drainage. Drainage is the. If you look at the, um, I, mean, I, I would say the east coast of Scotland. I'd almost say that the whole of the whole of 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 Britain. Probably the greatest, one of the greatest agricultural breakthroughs was drainage. It was drainage that allowed areas like the fact that we were you know, the, the, our most productive land in Britain to be taken into into cropping a year, a year two or three hundred years ago. And um, and without drainage, we're not going to grow crops. There's very little land unless you're growing on pure sand or something like that. That isn't. There's very little productive ag agricultural land which is not drained. But it, it requires a, a slight rethinking of the way people think think about drains and and there is a there is a perception there on on that you know that i don't don't always assume that farmers that don't think what's the, you know what's going on off their land that you know they are that there are people who think about that and and to be honest the, the government policy is 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 important in this you know there are there are a myriad of some you know of Incentives, uh, so, some compulsory, some otherwise, some voluntary, um, which we have to, and, and a lot of the compulsory ones we have to comply with now, which are aimed at, um, you know, at water quality. And you, um, uh, a couple of examples, Tom. I don't know if these are name. These are names that um that, that, that we're we're all. There are two main schemes that we have to comply with. One is called Geek, which is good. Agricultural Environmental Condition. I, th I should know this exactly, but I think that's right. And the Water Framework Directive, and they are statutory things. As a farmer now, you have to comply with that. Mm -hmm. And if, and as a as a farmer, I'm very reluctant to mention the words of subsidies. But if you if you don't comply with that, you're in danger that you you could be penalised from your from your subsidy payment might be. And they all they're they're, they're fairly basic schemes that, that water, field margins things like that, margins along water courses left uncropped but they're all things that contribute will contribute to better to better water quality i mean Ma marshall is there more that could be obviously there is always more that can be done but is there something that is uh, an easy fix that's not being done right now that you would like to see uh, you know undertaken by by government maybe with regard to to water quality and agriculture well, well one, one of the fundamental issues is funding um, everything comes down to cash um, and while there are grants available, um, some of the grants are very difficult uh, to obtain and require a horrendous amount of bureaucracy. And if we could cut through that and make the whole application process much simpler, it would be only to the benefit of the environment. The other aspect of um, the work and the, considering the hydrology is obviously with these large flows, farmland is more subject to flooding. And again, one of our um, ask, one of the ways we try and tackle this is by speaking to farmers, understanding what's going on in the land, and trying to offer solutions to flooding, which at the same time benefits the river. So we're always trying to work with farmers so that they have got to see a benefit um, of the work that we do, because we cannot expect farmers to give up high valued agricultural land just purely so that we can, if you like, have some fun and remeand the river in the hope that we... I can improve things for someone. Yeah, I mean, I, I, everything has to be in balance, and uh, you know, everyone mm. has to see some sort of benefit of it. And 
it has to fit into the the framework yeah. of what, what yeah. what's of, of most yeah. benefit to everything yeah. around us. But I, I suppose it, it is a really hard it is a hard balance to achieve. Yes, it, it's it, it's brought home to us in some of the projects we do, particularly the forestry projects in Glen Clover. We formed a steering group which has all the interests in it, and it's quite. Uh, amazing the number of interests that you've got included. Um, one of the important ones up in Glen Clover is actually the Royal Society for Protection of Birds. Okay. Because the um, flood plain has got tremendous populations of waders which are in decline in Scotland. And again, RSPB rightly are concerned about their status. Um, they bring a lot of pleasure to people. You get a lot of people watching birds up in that area. And they do not want trees because the trees host predators which will knock off the, the wader population. So you've got to take that into account. And then if you move slightly up land into the hills, you're into the grouse moors. And again, you have the same argument. People don't want trees there because you, get, you can increase the predation in grouse. So you've got to be aware of all these issues, um, all the other priorities and designations, and try and work with people to get a balanced way forward that, that does not adversely affect other interests. In terms of um, public perception of salmon, Tom, it's not something that if you ask the man on the street, you know, what species in our country do we have an issue with in terms of decline? Most people are not going to think of think of salmon, but they'll probably come up with, you know, a couple of bird bird species that we see in the news every second week. What is the reason, what do you think the reason for that is and what can we do to change that? Because it, in order to get the support to to help ensure that we don't lose a species, you do need the public on side so that you have the politicians on side and everything can, can push forward and, and that you, you can get the funding on side for that. I th I would disagree with you slightly on uh, if you just on salmon. I, I think I think the salmon as a species is regarded as a, a pretty iconic Scottish symbol of Scotland. I, you know, I think where you get into murkier waters is the general perception of uh, what, what, you know, is of, of salmon angling is that salmon angling I think among probably among the, the, the general population or the, uh, a lot of the population is regarded as a sport of the elite it's, an expen it's regarded as an expensive sport it's not open it's very restricted on who can do it it's costly and that, that is an issue I think that we should be you know, generally addressing we need to get we need to Think of ways which we can open up salmon ang angling. I, and I gen genuinely think probably now you go out in the river, you don't see many young people fishing. In my, that's in, in my... We need to look at ways to open up salmon angling in particular to a wider wider amount of the population. The, the, there are always going to... On the big famous rivers of Scotland, they are selling... Ex exclusivity is what they're selling you know, it, to a large extent. But that that may well, in the long term, backfire on the on the whole. You know, not the the future, but the perception, especially with the with the with our political masters, is that this is this is a sport, and it's an easy it's an easy hammer to to hit certain sectors of the population with. Now, this is a sport of toffs. You know, you know, why should we be putting money into this? No, yeah. it's. I mean, you bring up a few interesting points there. I, mean, I think you're probably right in saying that salmon definitely is an iconic species of Scotland, but I still don't know if you, you ask the man on the street, would they know about it being in decline? Um, it's rather interesting, that point, because the Environmental Agency of England and Wales undertook a survey of quite a major sector of the general public and asked them the question, how do you feel about the presence or absence of salmon in rivers? And they were quite surprised at the vast feel-good factor that salmon um, generated amongst just general members of the public. And these were not non-anglers. So the fact that you've got salmon in rivers is actually perceived by the public as a really good thing. And it increases the value considerably of salmon as a species, not just its sporting value, but its aesthetic value. Just the sheer presence of salmon is a great comfort to many people. No, I, I wouldn't have guessed that. And I, think no, it's it's a I, knew, yeah. I think if you go up onto the, you know, in the autumn to up, up the burn to the lights on the North Esco, mm -hmm. I mean, if you go to a famous place where people can see salmon running, it's amazing the number of people who will go. Yeah, Most of them with nothing, no interest in angling whatsoever. They like to watch it, though. Yeah, buckling to spout mm -hmm. on the almond. 
Well, you, yeah. you, you only need to just go to Edsel here and there'll be people with cameras yeah. out yeah. Uh, yeah. watching the salmon mm-hmm. run that. Do you think that those people who are watching the salmon jump are aware that there's actually a serious problem underfoot? In terms of the, you know the longevity of the species, I mean that's kind of what I was getting at, and I, I don't know if people really appreciate that. But if, you know, if you if you ask them no, about I don't, I hen don't, harriers, I don't, they do. I don't, you know, they do. everybody yeah. hen harriers are in the news every every second week. Yeah. Um, salmon, it's very rare you hear anything about salmon. There, there has been a fair bit of publicity given to salmon, and the adverse effect, particularly of fish farming in the west coast, on okay, salmon that's, populations. That is true, yeah. Um, so that has been a story that's generated a lot of coverage over the last 10, 15 years. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, we've been talking about salmon and pretty much salmon only. We have another migratory fish in sea trout, which in some rivers is an even bigger problem in terms of decline. I mean, Marshall, maybe you can in- enlighten everybody on that. I mean, why, why is it, firstly, that salmon is, tends to be the only species mentioned? And secondly, how much of an issue is the decline in sea trout populations? And is it the same issues? I, I think um, the fact that salmon are the overriding issue stems back to the legislation, which is all focused on salmon, but in the small print, um, salmon does include sea trout, but rather interestingly, not brown trout and yet sea trout and brown trout are the same species. So sea trout is a migratory form. Um, There are probably a number of issues in common um, in the decline of sea trout, but sea trout are a more inshore species uh, compared to salmon. They don't migrate way out to Greenland, for example. They tend to forage around the coasts. Um, I think sea trout have been more affected by the decline in the condition of the upper tributaries and the smaller tributaries, which have been canalised uh, to a large, larger extent. Um, they require smaller gravel uh, to spawn in. That gravel probably, again, is less stable and is more affected by these heavy spikes that we mentioned. Um, there may well be other factors we just don't know about, um, which affects the proportion of trout in a stream which will migrate and therefore return as sea trout. Because again, as Tom said earlier, the juvenile populations of streams, both in terms of salmon and trout, are really quite reasonable in many situations. But we are seeing um, less sea trout coming back, which may indicate that less trout are migrating and they're more resident. I think there's one thing that... It, I think it's important that it's, it's, it's not all doom and gloom. It's not a... Because certainly in, in terms of sea trout, I mean, the South Esk is the potential to be a, a, a good salmon river, a good Scot, but it has always been one of the great Scottish sea trout rivers. And, and that certainly this year, with the, this angling season that just finished, all the anecdotal evidence in the river is that the sea trout run has been hugely improved on the South Esk. I mean, hopefully that's not just a one year phenomenon. But everyone, all the reports coming back from people fishing on the river saying there's more sea trout in the South Esk this year than there's been, and probably in the North Esk too. Yeah. But I mean, the, the side trout is a f- far more important sea trout river, um, and everyone's you know feeling a bit, a bit more bullish about the sea trout situation. And yeah, you know, obviously we we need to see that trend. Hope to see that trend over a few years. But it's not it's not all it's not all doom and gloom by any means on the on the sea trout and and on the salmon front too. But, I mean, the North Esk still has a very good run of salmon in it. Very good run of salmon. You were talking earlier, Tom, about opening up opening up salmon fishing or uh, you know fishing from mi- migratory species on on rivers across Scotland and I can I can understand where, where you're coming from that point of view because if you've got more people involved and there's more people with an interest in it and, and an interest in protecting it one of the measures that we've undertaken as anglers a lot in the last 10 years has been catch and release how much do you think that that has benefited stemming the decline and is it is it something that we should be enforcing 100 percent across all rivers in scotland all of the time all i would say i I'm, from a personal point of view i am completely now committed to catch and release i haven't killed a salmon for for quite a few years i'm not in favor of any compulsory i think it has to be a personal thing and i i would encourage anyone who fishes to to if they catch someone to put them back, but I I still think it's it's not something you can you should be legislating on. 
Um, maybe there is an argument for the split off on the spring fish. The, the, the rare spring run is we say we should be saying, actually, you just can't kill them. That's it. Because, I mean, let's, the only known fact is a dead fish can't spawn. If you knock a fish on the head, it's not going to spawn. I can't tell you that that's going to save the river, but it can't do it any harm. And it must be. Putting a fish back must. It's a no-brainer, isn't it? That, it, that, it's, um, that it must be do a slight amount of benefit. I can't tell you how much exact benefit it does. But against that, there are still people who want to, want to want to take a fish, and I wouldn't I wouldn't you know look down at my nose at them for that. You know, if they want I, the one the one thing I think the days of people fishing and filling their freezer are gone, and that that I would you know I would um, speak strong to state. I would take exception to anyone doing that. I mean, there would be some people who say that if we if we really are in you know, the state of certain... And we, ha we haven't really talked about it in this discussion, but there are certain parts of the year, certain parts of the, of the migratory run which are more at risk in certain rivers than others. But should it be the case that maybe we just shouldn't fish for them? I mean, do you... Would it actually... If our interest is in preserving the stocks, should we not close the river? There will be some people who say that. I mean, I, I, don't, agree, I don't agree with that, but there will be um, some people who will put that forward. I can see I can see the moral argument for that. I think the practical argument is is not so strong. I've got experience of a river in Ireland, which is you know I don't know if you know the, the, the Irish situation. A lot of rivers were closed. They said there are just not enough fish in these rivers. We're closing them. You know, the, there's a river I know well in Ireland in Donegal, which was closed, is still closed, and it just fell off. A, I mean, the, 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 it has fallen off a cliff. Because if you if you if you remove Effectively, if you close it, you remove. No, who's going to who's going to want to manage a closed river? Who's going to want to do improvements in a closed in a, in a closed river? Yeah, there's no incentive. There's the no incentive, and then it becomes a free, yeah, and it f quickly becomes a free for all. Uh, Marshall, you know, um, with with your conservation hat on, would you would you agree with yes, that? Yes, I would. Yes, I, I think I think really it's it's so important to maintain the value of the river, and it's that value that generates the interest in improving it and trying to maintain it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's vital to try and keep rivers open at the same time where certain stocks are really seriously compromised, then there could be statutory measures to break these. But we, we have discussed this with a lot of anglers and everyone um, says, look, it, a voluntary approach is the most successful one. Try to avoid legislation. I mean, and it is also the fact that there are there are a lot of clubs and associations mm. that anglers are part of who are actually doing a lot of good and putting a lot, of, a lot back into the systems. Indeed. And uh, I think that probably a lot of that go, goes quite unnoticed. Mm. Mm. Um, I wanted to touch on um, hydro schemes, miniature hydro schemes. We've got a couple in the, in the Angus Glens. Marshall, I, I've actually I've had a chance to look at a couple of them. I understand how they work. There might be some perception that maybe that they might do damage to in terms of habitat i mean what's your, what's your take on it the hydro schemes are actually a good use of the resource provided they're located in appropriate places and certainly the couple of hydro schemes up in the south esk um, are absolutely fine they're above the level to which salmon will ascend there are populations of trout but their effect is really minimal and the flows that are abstracted um, are such that they maintain a reasonable flow in the burn even under low water conditions. So I personally think that the majority of small hydro schemes are of any good use of, of the resource. Yeah, I mean, the, the one, certainly the ones that I've seen, I, I was amazed mm. um, you know, just how they worked and to understand the idea that, like you explained, it, it is mm. proportional depending on the flow. So yeah. it would never be the case that that burn mm. runs dry as a result Correct. of the hydro scheme. Yeah. Um, but no, the, one, the ones I've seen seem to work, work mm. brilliantly, and uh, would, I think it's a good use of a yeah. resource without and, really affecting yeah, and, the system. And um, obviously, you know, we, we do monitor these. Um, Tom mentioned that the trust is project-driven, and that is absolutely right. But we're very fortunate we have a, l a lot of links with universities, and we get university students <laughs> up to come and do projects, which provides us with the science to... Um, justify the projects in the first place and second to to monitor the situation of the project has been completed and we have carried out uh, a number of studies on hydro schemes and they have really absolutely minimal if any effect 
One of the things that the, the Trust is very much involved in uh, in terms of projects is biosecurity, and in particular inv invasive plant species. I mean, Tom, it might not seem um, obvious why, if you've got a lot of essentially what are weeds along a riverbank, why, why is that a major issue to fish going up? You know, the, ri the river's still flowing, fish can still pass. Why, why are we spending a lot of money tackling invasive weed species? There are some, there are some, if you, you know, there are some basic issues you know, about water quality, but there are also basic issues about anglers. You know, the, um, if you take the burvy, so the Japanese not we were so bad that people physically couldn't get to the river to fish over, over large stretches of it. So that's, you know, I, mean, I think that's a valid reason to, to get rid of it. And um, giant hogweed again. There's health issues. There's, there's, you know, oh, Syria. I mean, serious health. There was a, a child yeah, not yeah. this year. I think um, was, right. I couldn't believe yeah. the, the no, severity yeah. of the burns. Horrendous. Yeah. Um, you know, Himalayan balsam. You know, the roots, tap roots go down. The bank gets. The, you know, doesn't help the banks. The banks get washed away. There, 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 there are a myriad of reasons why we we don't want them there. We don't want them there. You know, some of them. You know. Uh, not so uh, you're not so obvious to the general public because of the Himalayan balls that looks like quite a nice pink flower you know, why are you so worried about that but they, they are, there are there are good reasons why why the Marshall will probably tell you better about the actual hydrological reasons why, why they're yes you know, particularly um, Japanese knotweed and um, giant hogweed um, the can well particularly giant hogweed it dies after a few years and you can actually destabilize the bank and you get areas of bank washed out it's one of the things that we were concerned about um, when we started um, large treatment of areas of um, Japanese knotweed, would we be destabilizing the banks? But in actual fact, the root system of Japanese knotweed retains the bank for a few years after the plant has actually been killed, and it gives time for successing ve successor vegetation to become established and restabilize the bank. In terms of, I mean, maybe for for those people who don't understand biosecurity as a problem, can you kind of summarise that, Marshall? Yes, it's it's really the, the prevention of non-native species becoming established in the area. And in terms of the biggest biosecurity issues that we have in Angus or for Scotland as a whole, what what should people well, be so looking out for? Certainly, Angus it's invasive plants, mink, and um, signal crayfish. Uh, signal crayfish is an interesting one because uh, there was just um, an article out this week. In the Ayrshire catchment, and they had, they have they had reports of signal crayfish, they, and they put down traps um, under license, and they have confirmed that they now have signal crayfish. They didn't release which river it actually was, but it was obviously in a river that they didn't have them before. Where did they come from, and what is what is the issue? I mean, they just look like for, for some people, they just look like something tasty to eat. Yeah, well, I suspect they probably have a wider distribution in Scotland than um, has been established so far. And because people haven't really looked for them carefully. Um, but sadly, we have them within the North Esk uh, catchment, and they have been deliberately introduced. Um, and where they're deliberately introduced, they can spread because they can travel overland um, for quite some distance, so they can re-establish themselves in other catchments and other tributaries. Um, we've tried to control them and we've been successful in eliminating them from one location where there was a, a very definitive water body and it was totally enclosed. In the other area where there's a series of ponds with ditches and there was no clear map of drainage channels and a lot of very wetted, wet areas, we were unsuccessful in eliminating them. But we did reduce the population considerably. Um, but they are still a major worry because, again, they burrow into the banks, they can cause bank collapse, excessive silt, and they do eat um, salmon, uh, juvenile salmon and um, salmon eggs. So, I mean, is there is there a solution to this problem in the long term, or is this something that is, looks very likely like we're just going to have to live with it across all the river systems? Sadly, I suspect in some cases we may well have to live with the problem. Because and just, that there is the case, because there, there just in, isn't a method. I mean, you, you really have to resort to poisoning. And if you poison a river, you kill absolutely everything in it. And nobody wants that. Mm. Um, you can certainly trap them. You can electric fish them, which will keep the population down. But it will not eliminate it. Yeah, it's probably worth pointing out, because I know somebody did get caught, uh, caught out with this not that long ago. I think it was down in, 
it could, I think it was down in England, but you can't actually just go and go and travel. That's right. You need, it does you need have to be license. under, under yeah. license. Yeah. So. Yeah. In fact, the, the instance that I can think of, there was a chap who thought he was doing a good deed by removing mm. signal crayfish and in actual fact he had misidentified them and he was killing native crayfish. Yeah, indeed. But actually, I mean, that's uh, something I, I hadn't thought of before. Why are the native crayfish not a, not a problem? Well, we don't have native crayfish in Scotland. No, I mean, I'm not talking but about it, in England. Well, they're adapted to the environment there and they don't have the same... They're, they're not nearly as big as the American signal crayfish. Do they still eat um, salmon eggs? I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not, I'm, don't know an awful lot. But but the they've they've never managed to migrate north of the border. Do you no, know why that is? I don't. Um, it's probably conditions level. are not suitable for them up here. Uh, Tom, have you have you come across them before? No. Simple answer. No. No, no. I'm not aware of them in the Lunan. I mean, I, I farm in the Lunan catchment and, and I'm not aware of any of them. No. Um, um, you mentioned uh, you know, species being deliberately introduced. One thing that springs to mind talking about that is, is beavers. Now, I know that there's been... A, there's been specific pilot pilot projects for this in years gone by, but it, it's pretty much accepted now that the Tay system certainly that you know there's beavers throughout the whole Tay system. Tom, what 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 is the impact of that on on what what we're talking about, which is you know migratory fish? Do the beavers have a direct impact on that, or has it not been proven yet? I I, I think it's the latter. I don't think it's been proven yet. I mean. I, Obviously, if you, uh, to me, a beaver will build a dam, and a dam, you know, can can dam a river. Uh, you know, I'm not I'm not convinced. How, you know, you're looking at smaller upper tribu- upper catchment spawning burns. I thought where there'd be a problem. I mean, I think there are there are there are huge problems on in terms of agricultural drainage, and that's going to be a way bigger issue than it, it go, as the thing goes forward than. Than blocking my, migratory fishes, I think there are going to be you know, other issues. Of other issues which will 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 loom far larger than migratory fish in, in in the whole beaver, in the whole beaver thing. Um, I have to own up, say that I was a trustee of the Scottish Wildlife Trust when they were when the first introdu- reintroductions were done, but I wasn't. In, I'm not. I'm not in favour of reintroductions, and I did fight a rather losing, well, a definitely losing, corner against them. Um, against them being re- reintroduced. I mean, has it, has it been, was it proven now that there were um, beavers illegally introduced into some of the, the systems? I don't know whether, I, th- I seem to remember something in a newspaper, I don't know if it was ever yeah, proven. Yeah, as far as I know, um, the beavers that have been, intro- have been introduced into the Glams area um, were illegally released. Okay. And there's now a population of excess, in excess of 150 beavers in that area. I mean, is, there being, expanding. is there anything being done to control that, or is it not seen as a problem, Mark? It's never been controlled, no. Um, there has I mean, been, well, there has been some control going on. It's not a... Yeah. You, it's, you, you are allowed to control them, I think. I think, I think you're allowed to shoot. Yeah, my, yes. my, my understanding yes. is that because they are because classed as an alien species yeah. at the moment, yeah. um, you can, but I mm. wouldn't like to say you could just take your, your gun out if you're a firearms owner mm. and go and shoot them. I think you'd probably best check with the police make sure it's on your certificate, but... Yeah. Um, it's, th- it's an interesting one. I, th- I think. I think going ahead, what need what we need to be, you know, working, lobbying, talking to government about is is that if beavers are a reality, and I suspect they are, we're not going to get rid of them in Scotland. That, that we must be as fishery owners, landowners, farmers, we must be. There must be adequately built into the system the, that we can be in where there any species can be in the wrong place. There, I'm sure there's a place for beavers in Scotland where they will do good and they will do enhance the environment they will re-wet mm-hmm. but there, there are plenty of places where they're going to be in the wrong place and if they're in the wrong place we must be allowed to control them so that, we'll just have to watch the space for the moment I suppose um, um, one of the last things I, I wanted to talk about uh, yeah. and I, I don't think we're actually going to come to a conclusion on this because I know it's still very much up in the air is the, the wild fisheries review now I know we discussed it in the trust uh, many months ago and I actually couldn't make the last meeting but I imagine it was discussed mm-hmm. then as well when that first came to light, <clears throat> it was going to be the case that every river would be evaluated in terms of its harvestable surplus, and that we were going to bring in um, a tagging system much like they have in Ireland. That has changed a lot now. I mean, Marshall, you're probably uh, in the best place to kind of explain how that, that, that's evolved. Maybe correct, correct me from the, the original, the yes, original I, plan. I, th- I think the original plan while it had many um a, a lot of merit it was perhaps overkill in terms of the angling side in that rod 
caught fish in Scotland are not permitted to be sold, and therefore there was, is not the same need that these fish should be tagged, whereas obviously the remaining netting stations will be subject in the, in the most recent consultation. The proposal is that they will be tagged, but anglers' fish do not have to be t tagged. As regards to quotas, um, that has been replaced by the rivers in Scotland being put into one of three categories. Um, category 1, where current conservation measures are adequate and the stock fulfills um, or exceeds conservation limits. Category 2, where there is a potential problem and therefore a management plan has to be adopted um, to protect the stock. And the third category, which embraces, I think, all the West Coast rivers and the odd East Coast river, is where catch and release is mandatory um, because of the low stock numbers. And a management plan, again, has to be produced um, to try and improve the state of the stocks. And how is that going to be... Is there any plan uh, that's been put forward right now as to how that's going to be decided and how the... How well, it the already has been decided. Um, the government have used um, such data as exists, and I have to assess there is a, a, a distinct lack of data because there are very few fish counters in Scotland, um, but they had to use what's, what is available, um, recognising its imperfections to come up with a system which will no doubt be modified as more data is generated. And indeed, one of the functions of the Fisheries Review um, is to improve data collection and improve the research on salmon such that um, these categories can be refined. So in terms of, uh, f from an angler's point of view, what does, that, what does that mean for them in our area, as, as an example? Well, uh, the, the North Esk is category one, so there's no change. The South Esk is category two, so we have to come up with a management plan, um, and uh, that will recommend, uh, to a greater or less extent, some catch and release. Um, and in respect of the Bervy, uh, it is category three, and therefore is automatically no fish shall be killed in the Bervy. And, and, and that's salmon there will be only. No, no choice about that. There will be no choice about that. And I should say that um, this new legislation is, is salmon only. It does not include sea trout. Why is that? Has that been deliberate? I think, I think it's deliberate because, in a sense, n not because they don't recognise the value or some of the problems facing sea trout, but just purely it's um, a lack of information on sea trout populations. But they have said that they will consider sea trout, a management regime for sea trout, in the near future. And um, when does this come into place? Is this next season? Well, it's out for consultation. The consultation closed at the end of October, and we expect to hear the results of that um, shortly. But the, I, the intention of government is to bring it in for the season 2016. So we just have to keep our eyes out and see what, what the government Indeed. does. Indeed. I think it's worth pointing out there is a huge plus out of the World Fisheries Review for us as locally to this area, to, to the S area, is, is that, I mean, I think it's well known that there's, the, uh, there's to be a three-year moratorium on, on <coughs> coastal netting, all coastal netting in Scotland. And obviously we, we in this area have the largest coastal netting company left working in Scotland. So for three years, that, at least, that, net, that, that, netting, that netting company are not going to be fishing off, off the mouths of our rivers, which effectively means that for the, hopefully for the next three years, somewhere between, on, if you take the average catches, between five and 10,000 salmon a year are not being killed off the mouths of our rivers. Mm -hmm. So that, that, is, a, that is, from a, is a huge plus to our river systems. The, the, it can only mean more fish coming into our rivers. It, it, and more the, fish the, going back out. Yeah. Well, they're not catching them going out. They're not catching them going out. No, but I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so I mean, there was, obviously those fish are not just headed for the S. The, 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 all the rivers up, the, mixed, up the East Coast, <laughs> they're mixed up fisheries. So the, the D and the Don and, and should, should all benefit from the, the fact that those fish aren't being killed. I mean, what is the what is the plan going forward after we get to the three year point? Is this uh, is there going to be data collected during those three years to see what the effect is? I mean, what is the long term plan? Well, we assume there will be monitoring um, because it's only through monitoring can they assess the effectiveness of these measures. But everything is still quite up in the air with the Wild Fisheries Review. Um, in that, as far as we understand, there will be a draft bill available for consultation at the start of 2016. But the earliest we're going to see implementation of any legislation will be probably late 2017. 
I think that there's uh, there's probably a lot to chew through there. I did I did go through the the Wild Fisheries Review, and it's it, it's quite lengthy. And uh, well done. If, if anybody if anybody's <laughs> got a, a lot of time on their hands <laughs> on their hands, they mm. can go through it. But it is worth you know as as anglers and, and interested interested parties to see what's going on. And you know if they have comments, it, it is you know you can you can fill in the forms and, and put comments comments through. And it is important to be involved in it. Mm. Um, Tom, the Esk Rivers and Fisheries Trust, if people want to support that or be involved in it or see what's going on, what, what, what can people do? We have a website, which, I mean, I think if you just probably punch Esk Rivers and yeah, Fisheries Trust into Google, well, yeah. it, it will come up. Um, obviously, we, we have a, if they want to make you know, a, a financial donation, we, we, we've got a membership scheme. And we're keen on anyone, you know, we're keen on anyone, is, if anyone's keen to get involved in any form whatsoever, please get in touch with us. If it's only just to tell us things, if you ideas for projects, you know, <coughs> people have even got time on their hands, want to do things. We're, you know, we're we're always looking for you know for people to help with anything, and um, and it's important that you know, especially in the local area that you know, that we do know the more people who are in touch and we, you've got know what's going on mm -hmm. in the rivers, um, the 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 more information we have, and that local information is really important. It can be as important as you know what people see on the rivers on a day-to-day -day basis can be just as important as what a scientist is doing. You know, you know, the more knowledge we have about our rivers, the, the, better. the, the better we can, we can perform, yeah. definitely. Yes, I, I would like to endorse that yeah. strongly. Um, that there's a lot of people with a lot of good local knowledge who are out in the rivers, walking dogs, um, just observing. Um, what they see is very important, and um, we welcome contact, welcome discussion with them about any issues they're concerned about. I mean, there, there sounds like, and I know that there is, there, there's a lot of work to do, there's a lot more that can be done, but to reinforce what Tom said earlier, which I, I think it is important, is that it's not over. Uh, you know, it's still it's still salvageable. We, It's not, not the end game. Obviously, a lot of what we've been talking about is you know, doom and gloom, as you were saying, Tom, but it is, yeah, and I, there's I, a lot that can be done, and it, it's not the end. I, it, of course it's not, and I think it's important to not get too... Yeah, we, we, just to go back to this thing about all these problems in the sea, well, it, there's so many problems in the sea, is it worth it? You, you, sort, of, you, you sort of threw in this thing, is it yeah. worth us is doing worth anything? It, yeah. Well, of course it is. Yeah, yeah, we're not just... If I'm, I'm not sure I'm allowed to use the word. We're not just pissing in the wind. You know, <laughs> we're, we're absolutely... If we, give, we must never give up on the... You know, we can control what's happening <clears throat> in our freshwater environment, or we can have a large influence on that. I'm not saying we'll control everything. And we must always, and there is always going to be room for improvement. And the better we can make our water quality in our rivers, you know, the more fish. And there are huge benefits to other, I think the more, I, the one thing I've really thought in the time that I've been doing this is it's not just about fish. It's the whole, all the work we're doing, it's not just about fish. It benefits large other parts of the communities, the environment. And that all works through to only improving everyone's lot, really, hopefully. Yeah, we're not changing the world, but you yeah. know, one step at a time. One step at a time. Yeah. Yes, it, it's, yeah. A, it's amazing the number of interests that are actually involved in the natural environment when you start talking about rivers. And again, this is evidenced by the work we do up in Glen Clover. We have the Cairngorms National Park involved. We have local hoteliers involved. We have local landowners involved. We have the RSPB. We have the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency. We have Scottish National Heritage and the Forestry Commission. And we've got to try and understand all these interests. Um, and how they interrelate to get a way forward to manage the environment as a whole. I mean, just just finally, um, finally, Marshall, we have pretty much accepted the fact that we will continue to do everything that's possible to improve the habitat that we mm -hmm. have, you know, on our mm -hmm. inland rivers. Is there anything going on right now in terms of research out at sea yeah, that, that I, I maybe haven't haven't sorry, sorry. Re research at sea for? Returning, returning some. Well, there's a great deal. I mean, there's been there's been some major projects carried out in the last five years to to identify the migratory routes that salmon take to sea to try and give them greater protection from um, trawlers who could harvest um, large numbers of, of um, post smolts at sea, um, and also trying to establish where the fish go because we had these scares a couple of years ago about these thin grills coming back and a disease called rent vents red vent syndrome and again it's all pointing to a marine problem and the more understanding we can have about what's going on at sea the better and is there 
Is there an ongoing project name that anybody can... Uh... Well, the big project was called the Salsi Project. Um, is and that over that, now? That is over now. But again, there's various spin-offs from that. Um, there's a lot of genetic work trying to identify um, stocks of salmon and I'm trying to let these back to individual river systems. So there's a great deal of research ongoing to try and improve our knowledge of salmon at sea. So, But I, su I suppose ultimately if we were able to, to have a conclusion to the protection of salmon at mm. sea, that would go, I mean, at proportionally compared to what we can do actually, you know, on, on land on our inland rivers, that would have... It could have a major a impact, major yeah, impact. major beneficial but impact, yeah. at the moment, we've just got to carry on yeah. trying to work out... Yeah, we've got to do the maximum we can at this end in Scotland to protect this valuable resource. I mean, the, out, out at sea, what, can be, what could be done by our actual, our own governments? I mean, it's going to have to be more than just our governments. It's going to have to be... It, a, it's an going to be an, inter, an international effort to protect salmon and to protect migratory routes and to... Uh, curtail, if not eliminate, high seas fisheries. And that's the bottom line. Yeah. I know, uh, and well, I think we'll, we'll probably finish on this, but uh, currently as we speak, two of the, the biggest trawlers in the entire world are sitting in the Irish Sea. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's uh, probably quite a good example of what needs to be yeah. needs to be curtailed. But thank you both for, for joining us. I think mm -hmm. there's been some really interesting discussion there, and I'm sure that we'll we will get some feedback in due course and hopefully have you on again when we when we have uh, more update, possibly next year once the, the Wild Fisheries Review comes out. But thanks very much for your time, Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for listening to the podcast. I've certainly been educated today, and as a diver myself, I have a full appreciation of things underwater. Fish always fascinate me. I, Byron dives as well, and he'll tell you, I'll sit and stare at fish underwater for a very long time. Not just fish. I, I appreciate everything underwater. It's not normal, Daryl. <laughs> but, I mean, you you always uh, have told me stories of when you've been diving up, up around sky and the damage that has been done at sea. Of dredging. Of dredging, yeah. yeah and I, I remember at the time that certainly made an impact and you hadn't appreciated it before seeing it with your own eyes. No, and, and it's it's a thing that because it's not seen, it's not talked about. And I guess, I think people do care about it, but it's just not seen. And, uh, you know, the, the, there is damaging things going on in our oceans. Um, but the awareness isn't there. The awareness isn't there. I think I think people do appreciate that there is stuff going on in our oceans, plastic bags, those kind of things. But there is practices going on in our oceans that, as a diver, I've seen firsthand. But it's not really talked about. Yeah, no, no. P people need to uh, pay attention. I mean, the information is actually there. You do see bits in news items. But when you see something that might look of interest, it's worth spending that five, ten minutes just to dig, in it, dig into it a bit more read the full article and you know read some of the documents that are out there there's a lot of research going on i mean i mean i mean i'm talking when i've seen the damage i'm talking about um scallops um here and uh when f from diving on the west coast of scotland i now make a very very conscious effort if i go to a restaurant and i'm buying these things i make sure it's hand dived um because the the damage that's done on a commercial scale is just well, it's, it's actually quite disgusting underwater. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all about it's all about education. If people can support the practices which are best practice, then it means that the the things which are not good for our environment will will cease to exist because there'll be no, no demand for it. But thank you very much for listening and. The last few weeks of our podcast have done phenomenally well. So thank you very much for all the downloading that you've been doing on iTunes and Stitcher, um, as well as uh, listening on SoundCloud and YouTube as well. I mean, the, the response we've had in the last few weeks has actually been phenomenal, hasn't it, Brian? Yeah, no, it's been great. And uh, we really appreciate everybody who listens. And we would encourage you to check out uh, our social media feeds, um, Facebook. We're on Twitter as well. If you've got any questions, chuck them on there. Uh, we, we, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll take into account anything that anybody has to say and uh, we'll, we'll hopefully try and bring it up in future podcasts. You, you, can, you can find um, this podcast on the Interwilderness Facebook page or um, also on the Pace Productions UK Facebook uh, page. And it's all there in a the library. You can download. Uh, I know on iTunes you can download previous podcasts as well. So, And we would encourage you to let someone know about this podcast. Tell someone... Tell someone that you think would enjoy about it, and uh, yeah, and no, I think that, that that's the challenge for for the next two weeks is introduce this to somebody who isn't listening already, and, and uh, even better if there's somebody who's actually 
not necessarily into shooting, into fishing. I mean, it's we hopefully design these in a way that it's informative and interesting, even if it's not a daily activity that you're you're taking part on in the countryside. Anybody who even just likes walking their dogs, you know, in in the countryside and country lanes, they should be able to take something from these discussions. Uh, and we've had a huge amount of people saying, you know, this is great for my morning commute and and stuff like that so you know and, and it is available like i said before it's available on itunes it's on stitcher which is an android um based service which is also on apple as well it's on soundcloud and it's on youtube hit subscribe if you subscribe it, you get it a day early basically uh when it's uh, released on itunes and stitcher thank you very much everybody for listening and uh we will meet you again in two weeks time when we'll bring you another podcast thank you very much this podcast has been brought to you by the Scottish Association for Country Sports.